Well, thank you so much, Allison. It's our great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. I'm Janine ward lonergan And I'm Robert Peretti. And we want to welcome all of you to our presentation on reframing our thinking as SLPs, the language literacy dyslexia connection. And here we have just a little bit of information about our background and our disclosure slide as well. And I want to share with you our learner outcomes for today. Uh, first of all, we want to identify areas of language that SLPs may address to support literacy development in students with language disorders and language learning disabilities, including dyslexia. Secondly, we would like to discuss the SLP's role in literacy assessment in the public schools and how to link the assessment results of transdisciplinary team members in the assessment process. And our third learning outcome is that we will describe transdisciplinary treatment techniques, strategies, and approaches that may be used to support this population of students. So SLPs support literacy development in so many ways. And here we have a quote from Jerry Wallach, uh, where she stated that it is a little frustrating to think that after decades of amazing research and clinical practice, we are still trying to figure out the role of speech language pathologists in literacy learning. To answer the question simply is to say that the role speech language pathologists should play in literacy learning is broad, collaborative, and dynamic. And I think this quote that she wrote back in 1998 is highly relevant today for all of us. And what does ASHA say about our roles? Well, ASHA says that SLPs absolutely support literacy development. And in 2001, they published a highly critical position paper titled Roles and Responsibilities of SLPs with respect to reading and writing in children and adolescents that confirmed and promoted the major roles that SLPs play in supporting literacy development through prevention, identification, assessment, and treatment. And some important points to keep in mind are that spoken language, meaning listening and speaking, serves as the foundation for written language, reading and writing. And they exist in a symbiotic reciprocal relationship where each one flows into and supports the other. And as you all know, children with spoken language delays and dis disorders frequently have difficulties with reading and writing, written language, and vice versa. And we've also learned over the years that spoken language intervention can facilitate growth in written language and written language intervention can facilitate growth in spoken language. So where are we today? Well, despite the decades of research that describes the major roles and responsibilities that we play as SLPs in supporting literacy development, there still exists much confusion and inconsistency in practice. And it is clearly time for SLPs to embrace our roles, to seek continuing education, and to make use of the vast amount of existing research and resources that are available to us including ASHA's position paper that I just mentioned, ASHA's practice portal, it's a fantastic resource, and other guidelines for supporting students who struggle with literacy skills. And on our next slide here, uh, we have the simple view of reading depicted, and this is the most prevalent view of reading researchers today and provides a very useful framework for differentiating typical readers from those with dyslexia and other types of reading disabilities. And it suggests that reading is dependent on both efficient word recognition and language comprehension abilities. So you'll notice in the upper left quadrant, you'll see dyslexia written there. And dyslexia is one specific type of a reading disability and a common subtype of a language learning disability that is primarily characterized by inaccurate word recognition abilities with good language comprehension. Another type of reading disability is one that is described as a specific reading comprehension deficit. And you see this here on the lower right quadrant. And this type of profile is primarily characterized by accurate word recognition or decoding skills, but poor language comprehension. And these comprehension deficits are often related to problems with morphology, syntax, and semantics in addition to phonology. And then in the lower left quadrant, we have a third type of reading disability, which is a mixed decoding comprehension deficit. 
And this type is primarily characterized by poor word recognition and poor language comprehension. And then, of course, in the upper right quadrant, you see the profile for a typical reader who has good word recognition skills and good language comprehension skills. So what is dyslexia? Well, here we have a definition from the International Dyslexia Association that is uh, widely uh, referred to and has been uh, adapted um, by the U.S. National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and is cited um, and included in many state education codes. And it tells us that dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. And as I just mentioned, it's often characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. And it's important to note that these difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language, which is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and effective classroom instruction. Individuals with dyslexia are very bright individuals, and that's why it is stated that this is an unexpected difficulty, uh, given their cognitive abilities and the fact that they may have had very good classroom instruction. Now, secondary consequences may include problems with reading comprehension and reduced reading experience. And of course, if you're struggling to decode and you have problems with word recognition, that will have a secondary effect on your comprehension skills and your ability to acquire new vocabulary and gain background knowledge. So that's what's being referred to here. And we know that uh, dyslexia may be understood as one type of a specific learning disability. Um, and this comes from our California Code of Regulations. Uh, each state has their own. Um, but this uh, is one where it's reminding us that there is a disorder of one or more basic psychological processes um, that uh, are involved in understanding or using language. And the term dyslexia has all, always been included in uh, this particular uh, section of our ed code, but what is new uh, or more recent, I should say, uh, was the addition of phonological processing, uh, which you see um, highlighted in bold here as one of the uh, basic psychological processes that may be uh, an area of weakness for an individual with dyslexia. So that was an important addition um, that uh, was um, made our ed code more accurate for um, describing students with dyslexia. And specific learning disabilities uh, do not include learning problems that are primarily the result of visual hearing, or motor, or uh, intellectual disabilities, emotional disturbance, or environmental, cultural, or economic disadvantage. Now, this is our model of language from Bloom and Leahy that I know you're all very familiar with, where we have language form, which is comprised of phonology, morphology, and syntax. That's our structure of language. We have language content, which is the meaning of language, and that's comprised of semantics. And we have language use, which is the function or purpose for language. And this is comprised of by pragmatics and discourse. And we know that individuals with language learning disabilities, uh, including dyslexia, may have difficulties in any one or more of these aspects of language. And ASHA has defined a language disorder as an impairment in the comprehension and or use of a spoken, written, or other symbolic system. And that may, of course, involve the form, content, or use of language. That refers directly back to Bloom and Leahy's model. And we know if a student has been identified as having both a language disorder and a specific learning disability, we may describe that child as having a language learning disability. So let's take a look at some myths and facts now about dyslexia. And this is borrowed from work done by Rick Wagner, who's one of the authors of the CTOP test. And the first myth is that individuals with dyslexia make more reversal errors than younger readers who read with the same level of proficiency. And in fact, uh, reversal errors are more noticeable in individuals with dyslexia because their age-matched peers make fewer reversal errors. And what is being referred to here is the idea that if you have uh, first grade readers, whether they're typically developing or they may um, be a child with dyslexia or some other type of reading disability, 
reversal errors are very common. Now, as typically developing readers progress in their reading skills, by the time they get to say third grade, those reversal errors have basically disappeared for the most part. Whereas children with dyslexia, when they're in third grade, they are still struggling to read. So the, the reversal errors, excuse me, are still um, noticeable, all right? And so it's based upon their level of reading proficiency uh, that's causing the reversal errors to be very um, evident. The second myth is that reading problems with individuals uh, who have dyslexia are caused by faulty eye movements. And the fact is that faulty eye movements are not the cause of these problems, but are instead a byproduct of it. And so when you present a child uh, with some material that is easy for them to read, their eye movements will be relatively fluid, going tracking across the page from left to right. Um, now that is true uh, in uh, typical readers as well as in those with dyslexia. Now, if you present somebody with reading material that is, is very difficult to read, for example, if you or I were to look at, um, let's say, a passage from an astrophysics textbook, and we might not be familiar with that genre and that, that content area, our eye movements will be much more jumpy, more staccato-like, right? because we're struggling. It's unfamiliar material for us to read. Um, the same is true uh, with a child with dyslexia. If you give them something at grade level that's going to be difficult for them to read, you're going to see those jumpy staccato eye movements that you don't see in their peers who are good, uh, proficient readers. Uh, but give a child with dyslexia something that's very easy for them to read, and then their eye movements look much more like a typical reader. Now, the third dyslexia uh, myth is that dyslexia is due to a problem in vision. And in fact, we know that it's actually due to a problem in language and most specifically uh, related to the phonological system of language. So when we look at characteristics of dyslexia, we know that students who have dyslexia exhibit a deficit that primarily affects their ability to decode or translate uh, graphemes into corresponding phonemes and to blend those sounds to form words. And it involves a specific deficit in single word decoding. And again, that's based on a weakness in the phonological aspect of language and only secondarily affects their reading comprehension. Uh, and spelling is almost always affected as well. So in other words, uh, when a child with dyslexia is able to read material, their comprehension is quite good. It's when the reading um, level of difficulty is too much for their reading abilities skills, that's when we start to see the effect on their comprehension. So basically, they're able to comprehend what they are able to decode. Now, I was very fortunate to have the honor of serving as the representative for the California Speech, Language, and Hearing Association on our California Dyslexia Guidelines work group. And this work group was comprised of approximately 22 members representing a wide range of stakeholder groups throughout our state. Um, this included uh, the um, California um, School of Psychologists, it included Federation of Teachers, it included resource specialists, parent groups, and others. And we met um, over the course of um, uh, several months from um, April 2016 through March 2017 uh, in a series of meetings. And our purpose was to assist the Department of Ed in developing uh, program guidelines for dyslexia that could be used to assist uh, teachers and parents um, and to help better um, identify and assess pupils with dyslexia, uh, as well as to plan, provide, and improve educational services for students who have dyslexia. And so these guidelines were written in response to the passage of uh, our Assembly Bill 1369. And these are considered strong recommendations uh, for local education agencies. They're not um, legally binding, but the goal was to provide practical information and resources for supporting students who may have dyslexia. And so this shows us our table of contents, some of the um, chapters that are of interest, and this is available for free on uh, the California Department of Education website. And I think it, it really provides a great uh, source of information. 
um, that's that's very readable um, for you and for, for others uh, that you may wish to share it with. So here's a chapter on um, some of the really fascinating research that's happening in the neuroscience of dyslexia. There's a great chapter um, on screening and assessment for dyslexia with lots of practical information. And there's a really nice chapter on uh, effective intervention approaches for teaching students with dys dyslexia. And here is the link to where you might access this document, uh, as well as a link to a, a related uh, research article about legislation um, related to dyslexia uh, at a national level. So I mentioned phonological processing as being one of the key um, types of phonological uh, issues that may be of concern in students with dyslexia and other types of reading disabilities. So when we're talking about phonological processing, we're really referring to an individual's ability to perceive, integrate, store, retrieve, segment, and manipulate speech sounds. And so phonological processing deficits um, affect an individual's ability to segment words into their underlying phonological components. And there are three main types of phonological processing in particular that are especially relevant to the development of uh, reading and writing skills. That's phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming. And phonological awareness refers to an individual's awareness of and access to the sound structure of their oral language. It relates to the understanding that spoken language can be segmented into smaller units, such as speech sounds and syllables, that can be identified and manipulated. We also have phonological memory as an important aspect of phonological processing. And phonological memory refers to coding information in working or short-term memory. Uh, for example, uh, if you needed to make a phone call, you needed to uh, uh, keep that number in mind as you walked across the room to reach the phone, you might verbally rehearse to yourself, 916-482-3951, 916-482-3951. So you're kind of chunking that information. You're storing a phonological representation of the sounds of the digit names rather than a visual representation of the numbers themselves, and you're sub-vocalizing them. So that by the time you reach the phone, you're able to retrieve that information and dial that number. And phonological memory really um, comes into play uh, when attempting to decode new words, especially multisyllabic words, where intermediate sounds need to be stored in memory while the word is being decoded bit by bit. And the third aspect of phonological processing that's really important is rapid naming. And this refers to the ability to quickly name digits, letters, objects, or colors. And it requires efficient retrieval of phonological information from long-term memory. Um, now, it's different from phonological awareness and phonological memory um, because it's not entirely auditory in um, mode. It also has visual components, too. Uh, so rapid naming tasks require speed and processing of both visual and phonological information. And people who have deficits in both phonological awareness and rapid naming appear to have greater difficulty learning to read words accurately and fluently than those who have deficits in just one of those areas. And here you see um, a model of phonological processing where we're trying to show here that, that phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming represent three correlated yet distinct types of phonological processing abilities. And a deficit in one or more aspects of these um, is viewed as the primary cause of the majority of cases of language learning disabilities. And finally, uh, central auditory processing um, is a related area where this refers to um, the auditory system mechanisms and processes that are responsible for certain phenomena. And these include things like sound localization and lateralization, auditory discrimination, auditory recognition, and so on. And even though individuals with dyslexia might perform poorly on these types of auditory perceptual processing tests, or possibly even be diagnosed with having an auditory processing disorder, it's still most important as SLPs that we assess 
um, and treat the skills that are most strongly correlated and predictive of reading and spelling success. And now I'm going to turn it over to Robert, who's going to talk about assessment. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, we'll dive into a little bit of language and literacy assessment across the transdisciplinary IEP team. I always start out by saying as uh, SLPs swim through their daily routine, the idea of taking on more like reading and writing can make us want to come up for air. But uh, I'm here to tell you we're all supporting literacy. So um, when I talk to my students or, or others when I'm out presenting, I talk about that this really just requires that we have um, our language and literacy lens on. So, you know, what that means is assessing with literacy in mind, um, discussing how our assessment results impact academics is really at the forefront of, of what we should be doing. Um, you know, and, and writing goals to the Common Core Standards is something that, that all of us do or, or other state standards, but, but many of us use the Common Core Standards. And so just as one example here, if you take a look at this English language arts standard um, from grade two, it's interesting because um, you know, it says, ask and answer such questions as who, what, where, when, why, and how to demonstrate understanding of key details in a text. And when I look at this, I can't, I can't count the number of WH goals that I've written. What's different here is thinking about um, the last part of it, how to, how to uh, help our students answer, uh, ask and answer WH questions in order to demonstrate understanding of key details in a text. That's where the literacy piece comes in. And that's really where the work that we do with our students comes to fruition because we're, we're hoping that they're able to do that in the classroom. So really thinking about writing our goals to those common core standards, um, actively talking about how our goals will impact literacy. So, you know, I always talk about the fact that working on speech sound disorders supports the ability to decode words because that solid sound system will lead to better sound symbol correspondence, better phonological awareness and better sound symbol uh, correspondence and phonics. Work on language, um, all of the language goals that we write supports the ability to comprehend what's being read. Um, another piece is choosing our target strategically. Can we think about choosing classroom vocabulary if we're writing semantics goals? Because that's really going to help with that carryover. It's really going to help with um, allowing our students to access the curriculum that's going on in the classroom. And then collaborating at all times with, with parents and teachers. So I try to divide these, um, these reading, uh, language-based reading problems into two areas, uh, which I kind of call profile A and profile B. I just do that to, to keep them really clear in my mind. Profile A is really about dyslexia. Uh, it's, it's dyslexia, it's decoding and its effect on comprehension. And the students that would, would fall into that category would have those phonologic core deficits that we were talking about, that Dr. ward Lonigan was talking about in the last section. We'll review those again in just a minute. And then profile B would be the other types of, of language-based reading problems. And these are often thought of as more generalized reading problems because students would have language comprehension and sometimes decoding problems as well, secondary to multiple systems of language being in deficit. These types of more generalized reading problems that don't fall into the dyslexia category are sometimes referred to as mixed decoding comprehension deficit or specific comprehension deficit. And, and as we saw those in the simple view of reading table, it depends on the areas of deficit that, that are identified. So a little bit more on the simple view of reading that Dr. ward Lonergan talked about in the last section. Um, we know the simple view of reading has a long history and it provides a good model for differentiating typical readers uh, from readers with deficits leading to dyslexia or one of those more generalized types of reading problems. Um, it suggests that reading comprehension is dependent upon both intact decoding skills, that ability to, to attack words, read words, uh, and then listening comprehension abilities, my ability to understand the language that's going on around me. Um, the following table is just another way of looking at that simple view of reading. This is the way it's presented in the CASHA position paper and resource guide, which we have a link to here and we'll refer to a few times. California Speech Language Hearing Association position paper and resource guide uh, has a lot of, of uh, really good information that's available for you on their website. Um, we were co-authors of that paper, and as I said, we referred to it a few times, but it has really good information um, with regard to assessment and both treatment resources that you might find handy after this, this webinar. But this table comes from that, um, that view in that paper, and this is uh, really where we talk about dyslexia, mixed decoding comprehension deficit, specific comprehension deficit and typical readers. 
looking at language comprehension skills and word recognition skills. And as we saw in the last segment, a student with dyslexia will have good language comprehension, but poor word recognition. If I read it to them, they'll understand it quite well. But if they have to read it on their own, they won't. A student with a mixed decoding or compre mixed decoding comprehension deficit has a hard time reading the words, but they also have a hard time if I read the text to them uh, because they have language comprehension problems on top of those word recognition uh, difficulties or deficits. And then a student with a specific comprehension deficit will likely read words quite well. Their word recognition is good, but they have poor language comprehension, so they have a very difficult time understanding what they've read. The final column are those typical readers. So those students have uh, both good word recognition and good language comprehension. So if there's something going on in the area of reading, it isn't because of those underlying skills that need to be in place. Those skills are there. Uh, we need to look a little deeper to see what might be going on there. So profile A, dyslexia, this is a specific language learning disability. The deficits are, spe deficits are specific to the phonological core. Uh, they're characterized by difficulties in accurate, fluent word recognition when decoding words and also spelling difficulties when writing. Uh, dyslexia is often associated with phonological awareness, phonological memory, and, or, and rapid automatic naming deficits. And you'll often hear this referred to as single or double deficit, the single or double deficit hypotheses uh, by Wolf and Bowers and Wolf and, their co and uh, her colleagues um, is it, a really fascinating body of literature that really talks about the fact that students might have a phonological awareness deficit, they might have a rapid naming deficit, or they might have both. Uh, and those students with both might have a harder time uh, with some of our uh, approaches to therapy. They might be a little more treatment resistant. So phonological awareness for dyslexia leads to trouble with phonics, which is sound symbol correspondence. And if, if a student has trouble with phonics, that's going to lead to decreased word attack. That's going to lead to decreased reading fluency, and that impacts reading comprehension. Phonological memory deficits, the ability to hold those sounds in memory, will also lead to trouble attaching those, those sounds to symbols, phonics. Uh, and that sound symbol correspondence will, again, lead to decreased word attack. That's going to lead to decreased reading fluency, and that's going to impact reading comprehension. Rapid naming deficits, that's all about that ability to, to go into the brain and retrieve oral labels for visual forms. It's a mini version of what we do when we read. We have to, to if you take a look at some of the tests, which we'll look at the CTOF later, you really are going into your brain and you're trying to retrieve labels for letters, numbers, and objects. So that mini view of mini version of what we do when we're reading, that rapid automatic naming uh, skill, there's a deficit there that's going to lead to that problem, retrieving oral labels for visual forms, which will lead to decreased word identification of orthographic patterns, or letter patterns, which impacts reading fluency, and that again impacts reading comprehension. So all of these different deficits are impacting my ability to understand what I've read. So uh, dyslexia, summing up here, is a specific language learning disability. A child or student with dyslexia has trouble almost exclusively with the written or printed word, another way of saying that. And the, the child or student with a decoding problem or reading fluency problem as part of a larger language learning disability will have trouble with the spoken and the written word. And those are not profile A. That's those profile Bs that I'm talking about, those mixed decoding comprehension deficit profiles or specific comprehension deficit profiles. Um, and, and many in the field would consider this a more generalized or garden variety reading problem, which is not as specific as dyslexia, uh, particularly when we're talking about a mixed decoding uh, uh, comprehension deficit where there's that difficulty decoding words and also the difficult time comprehending what's been read. So uh, this is the definition adopted by the International Dyslexia Association Board of Directors, and I won't read it, but um, it's, it's always good to come back to it if there's any doubt that dyslexia is a language, uh, is based in, in a language deficit. There, you need look no further than the International Dyslexia Association definition. I like this slide. This was created by students in my Speech Pathology 222 class at Sacramento State. Um, it's uh, really entitled Two Paths to Reading Comprehension, and it really shows how phonology is extremely important. Uh, that system of language being solid um, early on can lead to, to strong semantic skills, strong morphological skills, and strong syntax skills. If it's weak, 
it can contribute to weaknesses in those areas as well. And that impacts language comprehension. Uh, and then a phonological system that's strong can lead to increased phonological awareness, increased phonics, and increased reading comprehension. But if it's weak, it will do the opposite. You can have decreased phonological awareness, decreased phonics, and um, decreased reading comprehension. So this just is another way of looking at what we've been talking about, and it talks about the importance of all of the systems of language in the ability to, to read and to comprehend what we've read. So this table we're going to show you twice in this segment on assessment. We're going to show it to you now uh, with uh, one, two, three, four columns, and then we'll add a column to it at the end of this segment that uh, actually puts in um, or layers on uh, some of the different test majors that we might use um, to assess these skills on our teams that we work on. Uh, you may have other tools that you use and you can create your own fifth column with the tools that you use. But what's important, I think, to recognize about this slide, which comes again from that CASHA position paper and resource guide, which you will have the link to and have access to, is that there are specific areas that we often on our transdisciplinary IEP teams are looking at. We bring specific information to the table and we all have access to it and we all help interpret that information. And some of the areas that I wanna draw your attention to are in that left-hand column. These are things that if we really focus on, among the many other things we focus on on IEP teams, um, these things can really help us try to determine which of the profiles uh, our student best represents. Uh, or their skills best represent. So a, a dyslexia profile, well, let's look down the left-hand column first. Listening comprehension, reading comprehension, oral language skills, decoding and spelling, reading nonsense words, phonological processing, and cognitive ability. All of those pieces of information are at the table. Uh, so listening comprehension, for a dyslexic student, we're gonna find scores that are in the average to above average range. Reading comprehension scores, we'll see below average scores. Oral language skills will be average to above average though. So there's that split between reading comprehension and, and um, uh, listening comprehension that you see. So average to above average listening comprehension, but still a problem with reading comprehension, right? That's what we call a split in scores there. Uh, oral language skills are average to above average on testing. Decoding and spelling below average, reading nonsense words below average phonological processing below average, and then cognitive ability might be average to above average. We know that our students with dyslexia oftentimes are doing quite well in other areas, and this is an unexpected deficit, um, this inability to read words. So when I go down that left-hand column again, you can just think about who brings that information to the table. Um, you know, we bring information to the table about listening comprehension, as does the classroom teacher and the parent. We have a lot of information about reading comprehension from a resource specialist, education specialist, classroom teacher, oral language skills. We bring a lot of information as SLPs uh, to those IEPs. Decoding and spelling, we hear a lot of, of information being discussed from testing uh, by resource specialists. Uh, classroom teacher brings lots of information, parent. Reading nonsense words, again, same group brings that information to the table. Phonological processing, our testing might flesh that out. Our school psychologist testing might flesh that out. And our school uh, psychologist is bringing information to the table about cognitive ability. So this really gets at that transdisciplinary approach here. If you take a look at the specific comprehension deficit, the first of the two profile Bs, you'll see that uh, we find that there's below average scores in listening comprehension and below average scores in reading comprehension. We don't have that split there. So in this case, um, our students having a difficult time, it, you know, if I read it to them or if they read it on their own, right? They're, they're, they're having a hard time with comprehension. Oral language skills will see our below average in one or more subcomponents of language. Uh, but the phonological skills here are, are really quite strong or average to above average. So decoding and spelling, reading nonsense words, phonological processing, all are above or above or average or above average. So the student can probably read words very well, but has a hard time understanding what's been read. Cognitive ability could be average or below average, depending on the overall profile of the student. Final column, mixed decoding comprehension deficit. We would see listening comprehension scores uh, below average, and again, reading comprehension scores below average, very similar to the specific comprehension deficit. Uh, below average in one or more subcomponents of language when we do our oral language testing. But here we have below average scores in decoding and spelling, reading nonsense words, 
and phonological processing. So we've added that phonological processing uh, problem in here. So we're going to have a decoding problem as well as a comprehension problem, and that's why it's a mixed decoding and comprehension deficit. Again, cognitive ability could be average to below average, depending on the overall profile of the student. So this can be really helpful uh, as you plan your assessment to think about uh, who's bringing this information to the table and have we looked at all of this and where do our scores fall? So um, the SLP certainly has a lot of information to share about both profiles. We're one member of a powerful team, but we really can focus on phonological awareness, rapid naming, and language problems. That's, that's really where we come in. So we're gonna talk a little bit about speech language assessment uh, with language skills in mind. So what do we wanna think about? So many SLPs typically assess with a primary language test, which means a test that looks across uh, many systems of language. So the self five is a test that we're gonna to use today as an example. You may have other tests that you use. And so you can think about how that test might bring the information to the table that you uh, like to, you will want to bring to the table to, to take a look at these profiles. When you look at the subtests of any primary language test, you can usually see just from the titles, semantics, syntax, morphology, jumping out at you from the titles of the subtest. So you see sentence comprehension, linguistic content, uh, concepts, word structure, word classes. You can just see that it, it goes across many of those systems of language and it's gonna get that information for us. Understanding spoken paragraphs, word definitions, et cetera. But if you stop and think for a minute, what have we actually tested here? And you listed off the systems of language. You probably would list, uh, looking at whatever primary test you use, you probably would have been able to check the boxes on many of the systems of language, syntax, semantics, morphology, et cetera. Um, but oftentimes, we don't have enough phonological information. And so it's important to choose a test that has that information or to add other tests in. Receptive and expressive language information that our tests bring us are it's really helpful. It's uh, essential if we're going to anticipate the more generalized reading problem. And it's essential in any case because we wanna be able to rule out oral language problems or rule in oral language problems. But it's not enough. Um, this is a list that came from the CASHA position paper, but it's what we pretty much already know. Um, it's often recommended that SLPs will administer at least one comprehensive test of the type that I just mentioned that looks at a wide range of receptive and expressive skills. One or more specific ability language tests, if it's appropriate, that assesses one or two specific aspects of language. And then informal measures as part of a comprehensive language literacy assessment, those observations that we do uh, of you know, spoken language. I, I like to also look at the written language that's going on in the classroom, but those informal measures. Uh, remember, though, that we're one member of a powerful team of professionals who are working collaboratively. So together, not individually, we're responsible for the assessment of literacy skills. So as I said before, each member of our uh, team will be bringing other essential information to the table that will help define the reading problem or language learning disability if it exists, and we can interpret that information together. Uh, so the division of labor may vary depending on your work site. So collaboration is, is really key. Um, you can take a look in that uh, position paper. The link to it is here, but you'll see that um, the paper provides uh, appendices uh, with a, a variety of diagnostic and assessment tools in a number of areas, including all of these. So I say this just to underscore the point that, uh, that the selections really are numerous in terms of, of what we might choose to uh, use to assess these different areas. Um, keeping in the following mi in mind, though, can really help if we want to assess for both language and literacy. Um, we want to be able to plan for effective assessments. We want to think about receptive and expressive language skills. We want to think about phonological processing. And as a team, we want to be thinking about reading ability, both decoding and comprehension and written expression, writing and spelling. I think it's important to really assess with phonological processing in mind, knowing how, how that information is so essential to uh, these profiles. Phonology has traditionally been the most underassessed system of language, yet it's often at the root of the problem. We, we uh, many times look deeply at um, speech sound disorders, but do we really get to the root of phonological awareness by looking at phonological awareness, rapid naming, and phonological memory. Have we gone that deep? And that's really important. 
One option for this is to, to take a look at a test like the comprehensive test of phonological processing. Sometimes uh, where I work, I give it, and sometimes the psychologist gives it. We go back and forth. The information is interpreted by both of us. Um, if you look at the composite scores of that test, um, it, it really brings into play all of those things we call the phonologic core. So phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming are assessed in a variety of ways and deeply. And that's an important thing to think about. Here are some examples of what those look like. You've probably seen these before. Everything from elision, which is a very common type of phonological awareness activity or assessment, say toothbrush without saying tooth, breaking up words like that. Uh, blending words, so you listen, what words do these sounds make? Ham, er, hammer. Phoneme isolation, what's the first sound in the word fan? And then memory for digits from two to nine digits, being able to, to hold those in memory. Non-word repetition, being able to repeat words that are not real, like sart and Alyssa Schroll. Being able to rapidly name digits from a page or letters from a page uh, or objects from a page, depending on the age level of the student. And then there are supplemental subtests that, that go deeply into blending non-words and segmenting non-words. Uh, brings a lot of information to the table. And uh, I think then we move into making sure we're assessing with reading ability in mind. And that's where consulting with our education specialists, resource specialists uh, about their academic achievement assessment results is essential. Uh, Depending on where you work, they probably use different academic uh, achievement uh, tests. Um, where, where I work, it's often the Woodcock Johnson 4. Some districts uh, around us also use the, the Wyatt 4. Um, but, but typically, some test is given to get at um, these achievement, academic achievement skills. And I really like to focus on four areas, which I'll talk about in just a minute here. These are the ones I, I care about, all the information that's being presented by my colleagues. Um, with regard to academic achievement, but I really hone in on tests that get at letter word ID. These are examples from the WJ4, um, measuring the ability to identify letters uh, and words. Uh, and then that's decoding word attack, measuring the ability to apply phonic and structural analysis skills in order to read unfamiliar printed words. Passage comprehension, how well can I understand what I've read? And oral comprehension, how well can I understand what um, is being said? Here are some samples for letter word ID, everything from simple pointing to the A, uh, when I ask the student to do that, can they identify the letter, up to more complex tasks like reading lists of words in sets from simple to more complex words, all the way from words like at and cup to aggrandizement. Word attack, uh, this is really getting at that ability to decode phonically regular nonsense words. So they could be words, we just haven't used these letter combinations to make words in our language. So the, the person or the individual being tested has not had prior experience with these. So it really tests the system, uh, the ability to attack or decode new words. Um, the test looks at things from very simple words like web and ib up to words like armophodelectedness. Passage comprehension, which is where we have a student take a look at um, uh, they apply a variety of vocabulary and comprehension skills in a closed procedure. So, um, for example, in this case, we say uh, point to the picture, and there are three pictures shown that these words tell about. They re read the words yellow bird, and hopefully they point to the right picture. Then we have them read to themselves and fill in blank words. I went to the dentist. He pulled out my, and hopefully you get a word that, that is something like tooth or that makes sense in that sentence, which gives us an idea that the student was able to understand the, the passage or the sentence well enough to fill in a, a missing word. Oral comprehension gets that the ability to uh, complete an oral closed procedure. So things like candy tastes, I say, and the student fills it in, uh, up to much more complex sentences like the last one. Uh, observation of behavior when errors are made can lead to hypotheses regarding learning characteristics. Some people become so frustrated that their emotions cause them to quit. Rigid persists with the strategy that has, and hopefully we get a word uh, that makes sense, something like failed there. So some districts use the Wyatt for, but they do very similar things. So you just want to see uh, what information is coming to the table in these areas, because it really helps. And then, of course, there are other good measures of oral comprehension. Uh, sometimes the WJ4 uh, oral, uh, the 
pass your oral comprehension subtest is not given because it's on a separate battery, but we have information that we bring to the table about that that we can use to compare to passage comprehension. Many of us give the understanding spoken paragraphs from the cell five or the narrative comprehension portion of the test of narrative language too. Uh, and then written expression, you know, informal observation of uh, both oral language and speech is important. So both reading and written expression, have keeping those things in mind is important. So I really think about um, observing oral language like narrative, uh, and I'm also listening for sound errors. Am um, I hearing those aluminums or those higher level phonological errors? Uh, pronunciation problems with multisyllabic words, grammar and syntax problems, word finding problems. I like to see if they can read a great appropriate passage, and I just make a notation, was there decoding labored? Did they have reduced reading comprehension? I don't often have time to do my own writing sample, but their writing samples abound in the classroom, so I like to look at a writing sample. Uh, and oftentimes, they're being passed around at an IEP, so I can see if some of those spelling errors or grammar errors seem um, expected based on what I'm seeing in the oral language, uh, speech and language testing. And then review other subtest stories. I, I care about things like the spelling subtest and many of the other subtests that can also be helpful that are given on an academic achievement test. And here's that table again, and as you've seen in that last column, I've just written in the different measures that I discussed that my team happens to use to look at these different areas, listening comprehension, reading comprehension, oral language decoding, reading nonsense words, phonological processing and cognitive ability, but I'm hoping that you can create your own column five uh, in your own work setting. Um, and as, as a team, think about um, what measures you bring to the table that would give answers to these, these areas down the left-hand side in terms of performance that might help you decide which of the reading profiles uh, your student best represents or their skill sets best represent. Um, I'm gonna do a really quick IEP activity uh, sort of by myself and model it for you here with three different profiles um, just to, to show you um, what uh, what we can do with this table that we have. So I'm going to just let you take a look here for a moment. You'll have all this information in your handout so you can look at them later more in depth. But here's one student named Franco. Uh, here are his Franco scores from the cell five in the top there and on the bottom scores from the C top two. Okay, here's an observation of Franco's reading and language abilities. And here's sort of that mock IEP activity that we can do here. So if I were to answer these questions based on Franco, what type of reading problem is indicated? Well, if I looked at that, I, I would say dyslexia. This is just hypothesizing. Um, you, know, you want to pull all of your data together, but I would say dyslexia, which is a profile A, as I said, um, and that's where it fits on the simple view of reading table. And what's the evidence? Well, when I look back, um, you can see that there are very solid scores on the cell five in, across the different areas of language, but where the problem comes in is on the CTOP2 you can see you know, below average weakness in phonological awareness and very poor rapid naming scores. So the phonological core, there are weaknesses here, whereas other language areas are quite solid. And that goes along with what we're reading here in Franco's um, you know, description uh, of his reading and language abilities, okay? Um, so in this case, you know, looking back, and I'm always referencing, by the way, this table take you back to it, this table. And I'm going back and thinking about this as I do any of these mock IEP activities. I'm coming back to Franco. Uh, the next question is, what might the psychologist's ability scores look like? Well, I would expect them to be average to above average because that is very typical of um, a student with dyslexia. And in terms of the resource teacher or education specialist, their WJ4 subtests, which are listed below here, I would expect to see some problems or some weaknesses with both letter word ID and with word attack. I also would expect to see a weakness in passage comprehension, but I would expect to see a strength in oral comprehension. I don't know what those scores would be, but I would expect to see uh, something very similar to what we saw on the table, which would be uh, perhaps 
below average scores in letter word ID, word attack, and passage comprehension, and oral comprehension uh, scores being uh, probably average to above average, okay? So now, Julie, that's probably the fastest IEP we've ever done, right? Right. right. Yeah. Okay, now we'll take a look at Julie here. Um, Julie would be a little bit different. You can see the scores from the cell five on the top and the C-top two on the bottom, slightly different profile. Here's an observation of Julie's reading and language abilities. And then here's what we want to pull together. Now, I'm going to hypothesize that for Julie, we have a mixed decoding comprehension deficit. When I look back, which is one of the profile Bs, right? Uh, it's not dyslexia. When I look back here, I would say, why do I think that? Well, um, when I look at the self five testing, there are low to moderate range of functioning scores across the systems of language, They're mostly in the 70s. But now when I look down at the CTOP scores, I'm also seeing some, some issues there. I'm seeing problems in both phonological awareness and, and rapid naming. So in a case like that, um, I want to take a look at what are we seeing functionally, and that goes along with this. Julie's using simple and simple grammar and vocabulary orally uh, when she's read a story. When she read a story to the clinician from her school textbook, she had a hard time reading. When she was asked to read silently, she was observed to mouth each word separately. When presented with four comprehension questions, there was difficulty there, and she answered only one question correctly. So, really fits with a mixed decoding comprehension deficit. So in a case like this, I would expect that the psychologist scores would be average to below average, depending on the overall profile of the student. The WJ4 scores, I would expect to see letter word ID and word attack to have, be below average or to see weaknesses there. Passage comprehension weaknesses and oral comprehension weaknesses. The dyslexic profile, you saw that split between passage comprehension and oral comprehension. Student does better if, if uh, I read it to them. Not so here with Julie, okay? And finally, the last profile is Jonelle. Take a look at this. We've got some self five scores on the top. See top two scores on the bottom. Reading and language abilities here. So what type of reading problem is indicated here? Well, I'm going to say specific comprehension deficit. When you look back at the scores here, if you look at the bottom first, Jonelle has all the skills necessary to decode words. The problem really uh, becomes other systems of language, not the phonologic core, not phonology. So that really does go along with what we saw in the functional description of reading abilities here. Um, she didn't appear to struggle when reading, but she had comprehension issues. So um, this is definitely going to, in my mind, be a specific comprehension deficit. And I would expect to see that psychologist scores would be average to below average, depending on the overall profile. And then the education specialist would probably find that on the WJ4, letter word ID and word attack are, are solid, but we're gonna see some problems with both passage comprehension and oral comprehension because of those language skills okay case study four i'm going to just in the essence of time tell you uh is a trick sorry uh if you look here this is what a student looks like when there is no problem okay and sometimes we test in those cases but the truth is if all of those other skills are in place something else is going on okay so again, adding a few elements to your battery or helping interpret the findings of other team members with your unique language lens is really invaluable when defining the existence of and type of a reading problem that benefits students, families, teachers, and special educators. And I really believe that appropriate assessment is just as important as direct intervention. In dyslexia assessment, the entire team is essential. Our findings are key. For intervention, it's often the education specialist, but sometimes it's the SLP, depending on where you work and depending on what the areas of deficit are. But generalized reading problems, again, assessment, the entire team is essential. The SLP findings are key. We need that language information. And there, uh, with intervention, often both uh, resource teachers, uh, the, uh, the SLP, and sometimes the SDC teachers are involved. 
It all comes down to collaboration though. All of us play a part in assessment and you'll see in a minute if the same is true of intervention. Um, the keys are the systems of language. Those are the keys to language and literacy and we're a key team player in student success. Here's some references for this assessment area that we have for you. And we're gonna dive now into the next and final segment, which is language and literacy intervention, a transdisciplinary approach. Again, uh, the assessment, the intervention that we do all comes down to collaboration. The teacher, the education specialist, the SLP, we've all got a role to play and we work as a team. Our training leads to heightened awareness of social and cultural issues and linguistic uh, factors that lead to um, the ability to uh, read and uh, have successful language literacy skills. SLPs are among the professionals on interdisciplinary special education teams whose expertise is in the area of language development and literacy. And we're well equipped to support literacy development through both direct therapeutic intervention to students and through collaboration and consultation in, in a variety of different service models with both general and special educators, teachers, families, and other professionals. Uh, Shaywitz uh, in um, 2004 reminded us that there are several uh, essential elements to reading programs for children with reading difficulties. Uh, they are practice applying phonics and reading and writing, reading fluency and uh, reading fluency training, systematic and direct instruction and phonemic awareness, enriched language and experiences such as oral narratives and expository scaffolding, and systematic and direct instruction in phonics. We're going to talk a lot about things that fall into the category of structured literacy approaches here. Here in California, our education code defines educational services for students with dyslexia as educational services, meaning an evidence-based, multi-sensory, direct, explicit, structured, and sequential approach to instructing students who have dyslexia. Um, each of these terms together constitute approaches called structured literacy. Yes, and I think, you know, sometimes when we hear the term structured literacy, it may seem a little bit daunting, but when we re really take a step back and look at what we do as SLPs and look at the therapy we're providing, we really are providing structured literacy intervention. And when we break it down into its components, structured literacy intervention is multi-sensory, right? So approaches incorporate two or more modalities simultaneously. And we do that in our therapy. It'd be very boring if we, if we didn't, right? We do things auditorily, visually, sometimes tactically, kinesthetically. We also are direct and explicit. We're very good at directly and explicitly teaching students and there's always ongoing SLP uh, student or it could be teacher student interaction that occurs. And we provide structured intervention, right? We provide things in a step-by-step -step manner where we introduce new concepts, we provide uh, review and opportunity to practice those concepts with the goal of uh, promoting independent uh, learner use. And we do things in a sequential and cumulative fashion. We present concepts and skills in a logical order. We're very good at task analyzing and breaking things down where we introduce prerequisite easier skills first, and then uh, we introduce then uh, more difficult, more complex concepts and skills. And when we look at the content of structured literacy approaches, the structure refers to language at all levels, so phonology, orthography or spelling, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics discourse. So we really are very well equipped as SLPs um, and do provide structured literacy intervention. Now, we're going to provide you with some uh, ideas for what you might consider um, doing in terms of techniques and approaches in your intervention. And we want you to kind of keep in mind those different profiles that we've been referring to, uh, whether a child might have dyslexia, a specific comprehension deficit, or a mixed decoding comprehension deficit. And this is really food for thought. So you know your students far better than, than anyone else. You know what works best for them, uh, what's feasible in your setting. So, so we're just offering these as possible suggestions that you might want to uh, consider. And so the first group are related to the area of phonology, and these are particularly beneficial for students who have dyslexia or the mixed decoding comprehension deficit. So on this slide, you see five commonly targeted uh, treatment goals, and we're gonna look at each one and, and look at some activities, techniques, strategies that you might use to address those goals. So the first is improving print awareness skills. And we know that early book sharing experiences are absolutely critical to the development of 
emergent literacy skills. And what we mean by this is book handling skills, learning which way a book opens, that print goes from left to right, that you read from top to bottom, that, that the print is consistent each time you open the book, um, and that you must turn the pages to get to the next part of a story. And our research shows us that children who are read to as preschoolers typically have an easier time learning to read than those who are not, especially if these experiences are shared, where there's an opportunity to engage in conversation with the adult who is sharing the book with them, so where you're reading with them rather than reading at them, right? And so print awareness skills are, are very important in that early exposure to liter literacy and literature is, is very, very um, critical. Now, in terms of promoting print awareness skills in your therapy session, there are lots of things you can do. Uh, you can have a child look for their own name tag printed um, in your therapy room. Uh, that's usually the first word in print that children can recognize. You can also provide them with magnetic uh, letters, such as um, the types of alphabet letters that you might put on a refrigerator or felt letters or tactile letters, maybe from a wooden puzzle that they can pick up, manipulate, um, identify, label. Um, you can also create uh, printed labels for supplies around your room, for um, books and names of different types of toys and paper and so on. So when they see the words, they start to associate those printed words with the actual objects that they represent. You may use uh, signs in your therapy activities, such as stop or go, uh, more, and so on. Uh, you might make a book with words that have a daily song or story, especially predictable books like the Brown Bear, Brown Bear book are always good, where the child follows along by singing or reading while you're pointing out, out the words. You could also provide blank paper books for a child to write or draw in. And again, um, make sure to you know point out um, book cover and when pages are being turned and the way the print is, is um, appearing on a page during book sharing activities. Right now, a second goal under phonology is improving phonological awareness skills. And Lieberman and colleagues uh, have conducted numerous studies with kindergartners uh, that have shown us that the ability to segment words into individual phonemes uh, is really the single most powerful predictor of future reading and spelling success. So that's why we um, care so much about phonological awareness. And we know that uh, many preschoolers and kindergartners can detect syllables well, but are still having difficulty with uh, phonemes, what we call phonemic awareness. That's one aspect of phonological awareness at the sound level, and also difficulty with detecting onset and rhyme. And onset uh, refers to the initial consonant or consonants in a word up until the vowel, and then the rhyme is the vowel and any subsequent consonants. So for example, in a word like stop, the S and T would be the onset, and the op, the OP, would be the rhyme. And an important milestone to keep in mind is when you're doing your assessments and, and just observing children, is that by the end of first grade, typically developing children can usually detect all three. So they're able to detect and segment words into syllables, onset rhyme, and phonemes. Now this slide shows us a hierarchy for working on phonological awareness skills, going from the more basic level uh, down to the more advanced level. So identifying um, a sentence and being able to break a sentence into words, being able to break those words into syllables, then being able to um, break uh, those into onset and rhyme, and finally into individual phonemes like at for cat or dog for dog, right? And that's that phonemic awareness piece that we want to be working towards. Uh, here is a progression of phonological awareness skills, again, starting at the more basic level where children are just playing with sounds and engaging in basic rhyming games and tasks. You can have sound isolation tasks then where um, you ask them what's the first sound in the word like um, cat, and they say cuh, what's the last sound um, in a word like desk, and they say cuh. Um, word to word matching, where they're matching a printed a word with a spoken word. Phoneme segmentation, being able to, again, break words down into individual sounds, counting how many sounds do they hear in a word. Phoneme uh, deletion, say the word hat without the huh sound, and they say at, for example. Or phoneme blending, blending sounds together to form a word. Or uh, mm for run, okay. uh, go, oh for go. 
And Marin and Collada have given us a wonderful uh, uh, treatment program that you might want to consider using with some of your, your clients. Um, and it starts at phase one, where we're above the level of the phone in the more basic level. And here you can use some rhyming activities, uh, could be nursery rhymes, name games, where they generate name rhymes for objects or toys in the room. You can do categorization activities, odd one out. You know, which word doesn't rhyme? So you say sun, fun, hop, run, which one doesn't rhyme? And it's hop, right? You can have rhyming dominoes where you have pictures on dominoes that uh, people or children need to put together so the uh, pictures that rhyme connect. Or, and then you can have uh, segmentation activities, again, where you're breaking sentences down into phrases or phrases to words or words to syllables. You can tap or clap or snap for syllables. Um, and deletion task, where you're deleting a syllable. For example, um, say cowboy without the cow, and you say boy. Say notebook without the note, you say book. Um, and then identification activities, listen for syllables and words, you know, which word is longer, which one is shorter. And so again, these are at a, a more basic level, um, and so you can start here, and once a student has gained proficiency at phase one, then you can move into the phonemic awareness phase, phase two. Um, if you start at phase two and they're doing fine, that's okay. But if they're struggling, then you would want to back up to phase one. This is really our main goal of phonological awareness training. So you're using the same types of treatment tasks for segmentation, categorization, identification that we just uh, talked about. But now you're focusing on the individual speech center phoneme as the isolable unit. And you can teach descriptive labels for sounds too. Uh, for example, the b and the puff. Phonemes. You can have uh, the bug and the pub. The bug could be the uh, noisy brother, the silent brother. They can also be referred to as lip poppers. So just giving additional links or associations, um, descriptive labels for the child to hang on to. Uh, segmentation activities, isolating onset rhyme, initial final phoneme or sound deletion task. You can do categorization activities, which word doesn't end or begin with a particular sound. You can have children create sound collages. Um, if they like to draw, that's great. But if not, they could just cut up uh, pictures from magazines, for all sounds that begin or end or contain a particular phoneme. And identification activities, uh, listening for a particular sound. For example, is there an n mm sound in the word went? How about in the word wet? And guessing games for items that begin with a particular sound. Thinking of something round that you throw, it's a toy, it's a, and it begins with a buff. It's a ball. Okay. And once they uh, have proficiency at phase two, you can go on to phase three where you're representing the internal structure of words and syllables. And so many of you have seen the Alconan boxes, I'm sure. It's a rectangular shaped box that's divided into um, segments, one per phoneme. And usually we start with words that contain maybe two or three phonemes. Uh, the child places a Tyler token in each section as they say the sound moving from left to right. So, for example, if you had a word like fun, you'd have a uh, n, mm, and you go through that. Eventually, uh, you move on to um, an advanced say it and move it version where you might have two different colored tiles one for the vowel, one for the consonant, and then over time switching to the actual letters uh, for spelling practice. And then you're periodically using activities from phase one and phase two for review. So I think it gives you a nice kind of hierarchy on how to address phonological awareness uh, in a systematic, effective manner. Now, a third goal under um, phonology is improving sound symbol correspondence. And we know that students need both phonological awareness and phonics in order to be successful readers, that neither alone is sufficient. Uh, and so when we have phoneme graphing association or encoding, and graphing phoneme association or decoding, um, these require mapping of phonemes to their spelling and mapping of uh, spellings to their pronunciations. So with sound symbol correspondence, especially if you're working uh, with a, ch a child who has a speech sound um, disorder uh, or you are working um, doing any type of articulation therapy, pairing the printed letter with the sound it represents. So, so the letter B for the B uh, phoneme, the letter um, H for the huff phoneme, for example. Whenever we can, can present that information, um, both visually um, with the letters that the sounds represent, as well as auditorily with the sounds, that's going to go a long way towards uh, promoting 
liter state development with sound symbol correspondence. And here are some examples of some treatment uh, resources that you might want to take a look at. Um, there's the uh, Letter Factor video, which is a fun, engaging uh, video with kind of a catchy song uh, that really reinforces the concept of phoneme, uh, grapheme, or sound symbol correspondence with children. Uh, a couple of published programs that are on the market, uh, Road to the Code and Explode the Code, gives some really nice detailed um, activities and lesson plans for addressing um, phonological awareness and um, sound symbol correspondence. And then um, we have the goal of improving the ability to recognize sight words. And these are those high frequency words that um, are, occur in most um, textbooks and children's literature. And Dolch uh, has sight words from pre primer all the way up to the third grade level. These are available online um, free of charge. Uh, and here's another list of some other high frequency priority sight words. Now, some of these um, can be sounded out phonetically, but others. Um, need to just be learned by sight. For example, TAG for the, or OF for of, which they're not um, pronounced the way that they sound. And then finally, uh, we have the goal of improving phonetic decoding or word attack skills. And this is a suggestive hierarchy. Uh, if you're working on decoding skills, could also be used for phonological awareness skills as well. So you might start with the the uh, closed syllable VC and CVC words that have a continuous sound like am and sun, then moving on to CVCC words that end in a consonant blend with a continuous sound like runs or lamp, then CVC words with stop sounds like pop and cap, uh, CVCC words with stop sounds, cap and band, uh, words that begin with a consonant blend and have a continuous sound like slap or frog, then words with a consonant blend where one of the initial consonants is a stop sound, like crib or stop. Then you, at the most advanced level, you have words that begin and end with consonant blends, brand and clump, and finally those that have a three-letter um, uh, cluster, like split and sprint. Okay, so instead of just kind of randomly selecting words, you can move through this type of hierarchy when you're addressing decoding skills and phonological awareness. Another fun way to look at this, uh, oftentimes you hear, we talked about rhyme families, uh, rhymes, uh, but oftentimes rhymes are called word families or phonograms. The, the words or the terms are used interchangeably. Something that, that we do oftentimes in the clinic that can be fun, and this, this slide will give you sort of the overview and then there's some pictures, but you can do some timed reading and sorting activities, which are much like the RAVO program, Retrieval Automaticity, Vocabulary, Elaboration, and Orthography. Um, you can focus on the 37 most frequently used rhyme families in the English language. We've got a link here to a list of those. I like to start with those because if they're the most frequently occurring, you get the most mileage out of working on those rhyme families. Um, there's also the Reading Teacher's Book of Lists, which has uh, common phonogram uh, patterns and then more, more minor ones. So you can actually take this up and get much more difficult uh, over time. But it encourages word recognition and word attack. I usually take five selected families from the classroom that are going to be, you know, uh, visited in a literacy selection that, that uh, week or in the next month. Uh, I like to do it ahead of time. And I do these onset and rhyme activities with those. And I actually have students uh, have a journal and they have one rhyme family per, pay, per page. So this might be the act page, this might be the if page. And we have them uh, decode each page uh, during a timed activity. Uh, students oftentimes like to beat their own time. They don't like to be timed in the classroom, but I can say, hey, can you read this list a little bit faster next time? And, and oftentimes that really is engaging. Um, and then I put them on three by five cards and we sort out the different families. We mix them up and we put all the acts in one pile, all the ips in one pile, all the ains in another pile after they've mastered them in the journal. And then we add five more families to the mix over time. So here's some pictures that show you that. I use a word wheel, so that might be ack or ip or op or whatever the rhyme family, word family you're using. And this word wheel, you can use post-its. It doesn't have to be this fancy. This word wheel just happens to allow me to pair all of the different uh, consonant uh, singleton letters or blends with that rhyme family and we can decode them real and non-real real words. Um, and we combine them with all of them. Then we go back and say which ones are real words and write the real words. This was the Allen family on a whiteboard. Then we keep a journal, so there would have been an Allen page in here and then we do three point, the three by five cards from that journal. 
and do the, the word sorts, and we read the pages and try to beat our time on the pages. We extend it once they've once they've got learned words, we put the three by five cards in a row and we try to decode strings of those words like sick top and sap. So it is a word attack activity, imitating text and decoding weird words as I call them made up of previously mastered rhyme families. Like I might put ick op and app together. What would that say if it was a word, ick op app? And then looking for and highlighting rhyme families embedded in text. And as students get older, these activities I really try and take uh, right from classroom based materials if I can. Here are some links we're providing you that have been particularly helpful in the last years as we've seen uh, telepractice come into our life. Um, you know, I tried to gather just some, some links that were related to literacy resources that are online. And so we're not reviewing these, but, but they've all been used uh, by me, by my students, or by other professionals in the field and can be really helpful in the area of language and literacy if you want to take it to online literacy resources. Now here, um, under the area of morphology, uh, we have some uh, two different goals that, uh, and these are particularly beneficial for students with dyslexia and those with mixed decoding comprehension deficits. And the first is improving use of syllabication rules for decoding multisyllabic words. And here you see uh, six different types of syllables, whether they're closed, silent, open syllables, and so on. And the five syllabication rules that go along with these. And so. When we introduce students to this um, type of rules and syllable types, this helps with uh, not just decoding, but also with comprehension and vocabulary development. Um, we also have the goal of improving comprehension and production of root words, prefixes, and suffixes, and this is morphological awareness. And the Mega Words series by Educator Publishing Ser Service is a great uh, resource that you might want to take a look at. Uh, there are, there's lots of um, practice on the different skills and it's appropriate for your older children, adolescent clients. Uh, so oftentimes it's hard to find materials that work well for that, that age group, but, um, but that's one. So again, that's the Mega Words series. That's a nice one. And here children learn um, things like the prefix re means to do something again. So replay or rewrite or rerun. Um, so uh, the suffix less means without, care less, without care, or fearless, without fear, and so on. Um, we also have some uh, reading comprehension goal areas in the area of morphology, and these are particularly helpful for those students on your case who have specific comprehension deficit or mixed decoding comprehension deficit profiles. And so that morphological awareness goal here is, is very um, useful for this population. Also, improving comprehension and production of compound complex sentences. Uh, we know that there are four types of sentences in our English language, and we want to move away from children just being able to understand and produce simple sentences to being able to uh, do that with uh, compound complex and compound complex sentences. And then we have some examples of low frequency advanced syntactic forms. Uh, these are those million dollar words that make your speaking, writing, um, sound more sophisticated and students can be taught to paraphrase sentences from their textbooks or novels that contain some of these more advanced syntactic forms. Uh, now our next slide here shows some uh, reading comprehension goal areas that uh, are really useful for those who have a specific comprehension deficit and those with mixed comp uh, decoding comprehension deficit profiles. And under semantics, improving liter content area vocabulary is a commonly targeted treatment goal, as you all know. And one um, activity that you might use here is a semantic feature analysis, where you have grids uh, like the one here, where you have curricular terms on the left axis and semantic features going across the right, um, uh, I'm sorry, across the top. So a cedar uh, tree, for example, is primarily a soft wood that grows in a cold climate, whereas mahogany is primarily a hardwood, grows best in a temperate climate. And we're you start with showing the student a completed grid and discuss these words and attributes. Then you work together to co-construct them, and eventually you work in the direction of them doing this either um, in a small group or with another student or on their own. And this. Um, really helps uh, students summarize existing knowledge of word meanings and develop a greater understanding of um, concepts taught in the curriculum. 
You might also use semantic webbing, uh, where you have a topic, in this case mammals, and it shows the different um, types of mammals, and then they're organized into those that are placental, those that are monotremes, those that are marsupials. And this also helps increase categorization skills, strengthens word associations, and it's a nice visual or graphic organizer uh, to help students organize their own uh, spoken or written discourse and to help them with comprehension of what they've read or heard. The third goal um, under semantics was improving uh, comprehension of multiple meaning words. And so here we have an example of the word duck that could uh, be used um, in different contexts and with uh, different meanings. So we have the uh, sentence here, during the trial, the defendant tried to duck the issue and possible definitions. In this case, it's number three, right, to avoid or evade. Then there's a, a, and a room for them to uh, write in definitions for the word pass. Uh, it could be a walkway to hand off something, to approve something. It could be a grade on a, a test or quiz or assignment. In this case, it's to approve. Or, uh, members of Congress did not want to pass a law. Uh, and with multiple meaning words? Uh, you know, this is an, a way you can take it to the curriculum. I really like to think about two or three multiple meetings for maybe four or five selected vocabulary words that are going to happen in the curriculum in the weeks to come. And then I try to pair student-friendly definitions with pictures, always emphasizing the one that's going to be used in the classroom, the meaning that's going to be used in the classroom, and contrasting it to other meanings the word might have. And this slide is showing a uh, use of a context clue strategy. And these are four different types of context clues with sentences that were taken from students' uh, seventh grade science and social studies textbooks. There's one nonsense word that's underlined, and the students have to use the context to determine the meaning. So this, the first one, this is where the new cars are hubis, comma, or assembled. They could say it's where they're built or manufactured or made. And this is a positive of the four types uh, was the most challenging for students with language impairments in the research that we did, um, learning that comma or means in other words. And so that's something that we can easily um, incorporate in our therapy sessions, heighten their awareness of the existence of these context clues. And it's an important tool. We can't possibly teach every word a child needs to know, but teaching them to use the context uh, is really a valuable tool. And here is a strategy for doing that, where they consider the meaning of while reading. When they come across an unfamiliar word, they look for and circle clue words and punctuation marks, like commas. They use those clue words and punctuation to determine the meaning of the new word and then explain the meaning of the new word. And then finally, we have a goal of um, improving paraphrasing abilities. And here's the wrap strategy, where a child reads a paragraph, then you ask questions about the main idea and details and put the main idea and details into their own words. And this is really important in helping them learn how to summarize um, information so it facilitates their comprehension. Uh, and so you can take selected sentences or paragraphs from the curricular text and have them put them into their own words. And then we have uh, one last semantic goal um, with improving figurative language, that abstract non-literal language. That's very challenging. As you know, for students with language learning disabilities, here's four different types, metaphor, similes, idioms, and proverbs. Um, and so we can have students be detectives where they look for examples of figurative language and they bring them in. You can have contests where they work in teams to bring in those examples and then say what they mean in context in that uh, sentence or paragraph or story, what, what was being referred to. And here in our last area of language, uh, reading comprehension uh, for pragmatics and discourse, this is particularly helpful for those who have a specific comprehension deficit or mixed decoding comprehension deficit profile. And so improving narrative discourse is very helpful. Yeah, narrative skills are often overlooked. We focus on those systems of language, but it's really important for elementary school students, adolescents, adults, young adults, there are a variety of programs out there, uh, Story Grammar Marker Kit, uh, we link in strands of language and literacy, or you can create your own. Um, here are some examples of self-created uh, Story Grammar outlines. Right, and here's one for um, a passage on the record of the Titanic, where you have the setting, uh, characters are introduced, the time and place of the story, the initiating event or kickoff event causes the character to take some action, internal response, how they felt inside emotionally, attempt or actions, and then consequence of those attempts, 
and then the reaction uh, often occurs at the end of the story or an episode. And here's the second episode. And so you can work with students um, to complete uh, these types of outlines for um, stories and passages that they're reading. Uh, and you can also use a five W's comprehension strategy. Here is an example with a who, what, where, when, why, and how with, uh, for a passage about um, our tennis legend Roger Federer, you know, who it was passage about, where was he born, when did it take place, what were some of the major events that were discussed, and why and how uh, did he become one of the greatest tennis players of all time. And you can actually make it fun uh, with students. Uh, I often create maps like this and I create a simple series of events that can be flexible and used with any story. And that's how we go about our storyboard. It doesn't always have to be a board. It can be story grammar marker like icons on a string, individual paper elements on a floor. I have a colleague who puts the story uh, elements across the floor and gets that tactile kinesthetic motion into the activity. And I'm just providing you with a little way that you can um, break this up and start with a students in a group, take them through a storyboard and then get them to individually retell using that simple storyboard uh, a story um, and then type it up for them to take home later. Finally, narrative versus expository. Just, just to emphasize here that we, we talked a lot about narrative, but expository, the language of the science book, the language of the classroom is often um, very, very important. Uh, it's often really making its way into early elementary school at lower and lower grade levels. It's much more complicated, and this table really talks about how it's very different from narrative language. In expository discourse, the language of the curriculum or informative academic language is particularly challenging because, as you can see here, it can be organized in several different ways. You can have cause effect, you can have collection of facts that describe a topic, comparison, enumeration, and so on. Um, and the vocabulary is very technical, so it makes it difficult. Um, so we want to do whatever we can to support our students in this important area of discourse. And here's one example of a graphic organizer that could be used for comparison or compare contrast uh, type of passage with advantages or disadvantages on a topic. So you might have a topic like life in a small town. What are some advantages? What are some disadvantages? Once a student has filled that out, it's a lot easier for them to then go ahead and write about it or get up and, and talk about this topic in class. Here's another example of a causation or cause effect uh, graphic organizer. You might have a topic about uh, the Olympic Games, uh, cause being athletes trained for years and years with the hopes of going to the Olympics, what are some possible effects? And it could be they win gold or it might be they get endorsements or it could be on something like they, they might have injuries or have less of a um, social life. So, the point is that it gives them a visual way to organize their thoughts rather than just staring at a blank piece of paper when they need to write or speak about a topic. And then you can also introduce key uh, signal words for these different types of uh, discourse structures. So for causation, words like uh, because, thus, consequently, for description, call, label, refers to, for comparison and contrast on the one hand, on the other hand, by comparison. Enumeration, for example, such as, namely, so on. Um, and then here we have the SQ3R strategy for textbook comprehension, where they survey a text to get a general idea of what it's about. They read any study questions um, before they read the, the textbook so chapter, so they know what they're reading, listening for in particular. Then they read the text, keeping those questions in mind. They recite answers after reading, and then they review. They go back and look at uh, their questions and Try to answer them without using their notes. And then this is just a good link for a variety of different types of graphic organizers that are available for all of the different uh, areas that we just talked about. And finally, you can in, um, encourage comprehension and production of persuasive discourse uh, through things like using ambiguous advertisements where they locate slogans from magazines. They can develop their own commercials for new products um, to get them practice with influencing other people's opinions, beliefs on a topic. You can have them engage in debates on topics of interest, such as what the legal driving age should be, um, whether there should be school uniforms or not, and persuasive writing tasks, letters to school administrators about a particular policy. And finally, just reminding us that for those students that don't qualify, thinking about our roles in multi-tiered systems of support, response to intervention, universal design for learning and differentiated instruction and how we can share with our colleagues some of these strategies that while we might not be working with students directly, but they can work into their classroom and curricula to help 
our students. And of course, here's your homework. Let's start implementing these techniques. We know it's a lot of information, a lot of references here for you to go back and hopefully find everything you need. But we wanted to provide you with information that um, takes you kind of across the age ranges of students we work with in all of the different areas. And hopefully you'll be able to use this handout as a, a helpful resource and guide. Thank you so, Thank you so much, much for all of the important work that you're doing and for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. So to get to these questions. So the first question, can you speak to the average to above average cognitive abilities in the dyslexic profile A? Is that with processing speed and working memory included or removed? That's going back to that earlier slide um, with the profiles. I think it would depend. It'll depend on the student. I think oftentimes um, overall ability will turn out to be, uh, we'll see scores that are average to above average. You can see some composites on those tests, and I'm not a school psychologist, but you can see some composites if they are related to um, skills that require memory, such as the type of phonological memory we're talking about, that might be impacted. So you could see some of those connections, and, and I always consult with my school psychologist on that. But overall, um, ability is usually average to above average, so uh, oftentimes the dyslexia or the reading problem associated with dyslexia is unexpected. Very good. Okay, and you spoke to the work with um, working with school psychologists. Um, what about working with school occupational therapists? Is there any overlap there? Oh, absolutely. Yes, uh, we often share many of the same clients with our OT colleagues, and uh, we can certainly um, work together as a collaborative team uh, where we um, sometimes work uh, in a transdisciplinary manner across um, boundaries. We may have some um, goals that, that really overlap with one another, um, and certainly we can reinforce each other's goals so that the skills that are being targeted are more likely to generalize outside of the therapy session. Right, and we didn't, you know, we highlighted some of the transdisciplinary uh, team members, but but all of the team members really are essential. By John Pagno, um, this is going to be on March 21st, and it's again going to be at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and you can register for that over at therapro.com. And again, that information is going to be coming to you in the follow-up email shortly. Um, and it looks like that covers all of our questions tonight. Thank you both for presenting uh, such a great topic and thank you everybody for joining us. Good night, everyone.